Well, today on On the Same Page, we step into the world of children's literature. And our guest today is the author Darcy Pattison, who is a very prolific, has produced a lot of books, picture books for children, also longer books for the middle grades, and writes for publications. She's very much awarded and recognized in that industry and has a lot of insights into the world of children's literature for us today. She also has a brand new book. This is it right here, Prairie Storms, that takes us through a year in this fascinating habitat one month at a time. So, Darcy Pattison today on On the Same Page. Darcy Patterson, thank you for, for making time for us today and On the Same Thanks. Page. You're, you're obviously a busy person. You are a busy writer who yes. writes in a lot of different categories. And of course, we're here to talk about the new book, Prairie Storms, which is, is that what you call a straight children's book? It is a children's picture book. Children's picture book. Children's books cover everything from birth to about 19 years old. So any, anywhere in the, in the age range of school and getting ready for college. So the very young ones are board books. Board books. Yes, those are those very thick, heavy things that kids can't tear up. Okay. <laughs> um, yep. And then you'll get to actually children's picture books, and that'll go anywhere from about two years old up to about ten. Okay. <clears throat> and then after, and those are always thirty-two pages. They're always thirty-two pages. Why they would are. that be? Well, it's the way paper folds. Uh, the thickness of paper, the way it folds, it folds nicely in groups of eight. So eight times four is thirty-two. Okay. Occasionally, um, like my Oliver K. Woodman books, they are forty-eight pages. Again, a multiple of eight. Because the story couldn't be contained in thirty-two. Pages. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So yeah, occasionally yeah. they'll go to forty-eight, but most of the time they're thirty-two pages. You pick up any children's picture book is thirty-two pages. Okay. And um, then after that, you get into the category of easy readers, and those are for the kids in kindergarten to maybe first, second grade who are just learning to read. And those are the only children's books where the vocabulary is really controlled. What do you mean vocabulary is controlled? It, it limited, well, you mean? Yes, to, to easy to read okay. uh, words. Yeah. So yeah. the picture books for younger kids, you can have very complicated language because the parent or the adult is reading it's to reading the kid. Okay. So yeah. only those easy readers do you really control the vocabulary. And then there's what's called short chapter books, and that's for the second and third graders who are just moving up to novels. And then after that is the middle grade novel, and that's for those kids in the middle grade, say ten, uh, 9 to 13, 14 years old. And that's things like Tale of Despero by Kate DiCamillo or Because of Winn-Dixie. Um, oh, okay. Kind of yeah. a short, easy, easy, fairly easy to read still. Less and then, than 150 pages. That's right. And then you get up to the young adult. Okay. Um, and that can go anywhere. Um, Harry Potter's 500 pages long. Yeah, yeah. Very complicated. Kids are stronger these days because they carry <laughs> yeah. the Harry Potter <laughs> around a little bit. Now, how much of that uh, is, is fiction? And how much of it is what we would think of as nonfiction across all categories? Both. It can be fiction or nonfiction, yeah. and yeah. then the categories are just the way it's published. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. what we have in Prairie Storms is a children's picture book. Yes. Children's picture book. 32 pages now, we yes. know, that, that, mm -hmm. that it's destined to be that. Why, why did you arrive at, at this? I think it's a novel sort of book in that, in that it's, uh, it's like you read it once a month. <laughs> Although, do kids read it that way? No, kids would sit down and read it all, all at once, but um, there are many, many nature books that cover uh, a habitat and animals. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do in Prairie Storms was to add something else, which is the weather. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that gives that little extra thing for teachers to talk about when they read it, for parents to talk about it, and for kids to be interested in. Um, and then it just makes sense then to go month by month. Um, and that actually adds another layer that teachers then can talk about when they're teaching the months in kindergarten and first grade. It's a great, great yeah. thing for them so, to do. So you, you planned this book and, and wrote this book yes. with the expectation that it would also be used in schools, that yes. teachers would take this and say, hey, here's, here's a way I can teach. That, that's probably a great way to help assure that the book gets published, right? Um, yes. Well, yeah. I, you know, I really appeal to several audiences, and that's part of the difficulty of writing children's works, is you have to appeal to the kids, to the parents, to the teachers. So I want it to be a book that a kid would just pick up and read and enjoy. Mm -hmm. But I also know that the gatekeepers to children's literature 
are teachers and parents, and they've got to have a reason to put out the money for it. The kids don't buy it themselves until really? they get to be young adults. So the teachers and parents have to have a reason to buy it, and so I have to appeal to them also. So it's kind of a dual audience. Yeah. Now, these gatekeepers that you talk about, I mean, don't they sometimes relent and say, hey, this... I can't use this for tea, but it's just a great story. Yes, this is yes, a great yes. book with great pictures in it. Don't yes. they sometimes um, let that go? Yes, they do, but that tends to be more on fiction. And this is really a nonfiction okay. book. It's my first nonfiction yeah. for kids. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and so for the nonfiction, I know that it's more difficult for, for the parents just to say, oh, it's just a great read. I'm just going to read this to my kids. So, yeah, so instead what they'll do is, you know, the teachers and parents then want some educational value. And you chose the prairie to go through the seasons, which is what yes. the book is about. We go through the seasons month by month in the prairie and a, and a different weather event yes. for each month of the year. Now, mm -hmm. is, it, is the prairie land in, the, in middle America something you've always been interested in? I actually went to um, Kansas State University for my oh, master's degree. Yeah. So we lived on the prairie for two years, and um, I felt that cold wind blowing down from Canada, believe me. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's so that's what the the book is based about, and and uh, basically, uh, every month we, we see a, a different animal in this weather. Not always, yes. but a different animal. Yes, there in are different animals. Situations. Yes. And so forth, like that. So. Yeah. So the research was very interesting. Um, if you look at a prairie habitat, there are hundreds of animals that you could choose. So I had to choose an animal that was um, uh, easy to talk about with kids. But some were a little bit unusual, some were familiar. I also tried to balance mammals and reptiles and insects. Uh, and, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, like so you that, have to yeah. balance that. Um, but then there also had to be a storm that would go along with it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, just a lot of balancing and a lot of research. What were your great sources for research? Were, were, they, were they in books or did you actually talk to uh, wildlife officers? Or, or oh, I actually like did talk to wildlife officers. Mm -hmm. You know, I called the prairie preserves and talked to them about grass uh, burning you know, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, uh, when I do research, I do a wide variety of research from books to internet to um, scientists. Okay. So. so the process is you, you do your research and, and then you, did you do the research first or did you have the format laid out in your mind first, this month by month? Oh, format? I pretty much knew the format whenever I started writing it. And then the research was to fill in uh, you know, you, I don't know exactly, but maybe eight of the months were easy, and then you had to sort of balance the last four to get it in there and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And of course, the storms, you had to make sure that you, um, to balance the storms, and so do you put a tornado in March, or do you put it in August, yeah. you know, or September? Where right. would you put that one? Or, or later in the year. Now, now, did your publisher require you, because a lot of them do in, in nonfiction, they too, to uh, back up, do, do attribution for all your sources yes. and all that kind of stuff like that. They wanted yes. to make sure that you were not. Well, I actually taught um, freshman composition at UCA, uh, University of Central Arkansas, mm -hmm. here for seven years. And one of the things we talked about was documentation, those um, MLA style sheets, oh, sure. and how do you do a bibliography, and all of that was what I used for this. Believe me, I had to have bibliography. Did they kick anything back to you? Said uh, we, we don't um, know if that's solid enough information, or do you? Do you Sail through. I sailed through pretty well. Well, good for you. That's yeah. that's excellent. Now you have you have your format. You have your research done. Now uh, you have to find, as children's authors mostly do, to, to find an illustrator. I mean, they, nope, you, I don't do that. You don't do that. The the, the publishing. That's the common. That's the common misperception about children's okay. writing. Oh, is um, the author does not find the pub, the the illustrator. In fact, if you do, you've probably cut your chances of being published in half. Because then a publisher has to like both the art and the words. As a professional writer, I do the words and uh -huh. I'm done. Then the, the publisher finds an illustrator that they want to work with and they pay the illustrator. I do none of that. So why would they be less likely to, to, to consider you if you showed up with your own illustrator? Well, so say you, have a, say, say you have one that you've done both the words and the art, Yeah. then they have to like the words and the art together. I see. Okay, so they may like the words or they may like the art, but they don't like this combination. Hmm. Okay, so and you say that's more the rule than the exception. That's that's the way it works. In it's this business, very so. much an exception to get for you to to do your own illustrations wow. or have it done, and then they accept it. They almost will never do that. So you hand off a manuscript yes. to them, and do you even talk to the artist? Do you see the Actually, artist? Actually, you're not allowed to. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh my word. So you kind of, it's kind of a strange thing. I do picture this in my mind, uh -huh. but w at the point at which it goes to the illustrator, I have to give up that image. 
that that vision of what it's going to look like and let the professional artists do their work and then um, I d with this publisher I do have input I can I can do some critiques of the sketches okay um, so you, you, you do get some approval stages in there possibly. with some publishers sometimes sometimes yeah. I do not but mm -hmm. this publisher is very nice they let me see the sketches very good. Now, what, what are your, your illustrator is named Kathleen Reitz? Reitz. Reitz. What do you She's think of She's from Chicago. Okay. Um, fantastic colors. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, he's very colorful, yeah. Very nice. She did a lot of research also on um, the habitats that were appropriate, the anatomy of the animals, you know, how to, to pose them. Um, she does lots of research also. Well, that's, it, it, it turned out very, very nicely. and, and I guess though that's always sort of uh, you're, you're kind of waiting to see. Yes, Wait, you, you, are. you hand that you hand that book off, and <laughs> yes. wow, what's going to happen next? I mean, uh, for me, when I see the finished book, it is the death of one book, which is this book I had in my mind. Sure. And the birth of this new book. And I'm not an illustrator. I'm not an artist. I do appreciate it, and I do know something about composition, but I'm not an illustrator. And when I see this new book, it's always better than what I could have ever imagined. Okay. The illustrator's vision is just. You know, that's what they do. All right. So you've done your research, you've written the manuscript, you've turned it into the publisher. Now they have pictures married to it, the book is bound and, and, and printed up and everything. What, what happens next? Uh, well, people buy it, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> how do you make that happen? I mean, how do you, how do you assure that people are going to buy it? Oh, the last 10 years things have changed so much with the internet. Um, yeah. I do have an internet presence. I have a website, DarcyPattison.com. Um, I am on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash Darcy Pattison Author. I have a YouTube channel. It's, it's youtube.com slash Darcy Pattison. Now, what, what kind of videos would, would we find on YouTube that, that go along with these books here? Book trailers are really uh, popular these days. You know, like a movie has a trailer. Um, a lot of authors and publishers are doing book trailers, which would be a short video, um, something about the book. So for Prairie Storms, what I did is some um, multimedia. In other words, um, I can't put the sounds of the animals in the book, but I could do that on a, a short video. Yeah. So the book trailer for this has, well, what does a cow say? Moo. Moo yeah. What does a horse say? Yeah. Nay. Nay. What does a skunk say? Yeah. There you um, go. And that's what the video is, is the sounds that all the animals make. People do blog tours. Um, they do forums where they talk to parents or science educators, all kinds of things. And then I do conferences. Uh, the Arkansas Reading Association conference will be in November, and I'll speak at that. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth is important and all that. Absolutely. But adults, when adults go to buy a book, they, they rely on you know the book review section in their yes. local newspaper or online or the New York Times review of books. Is there, is there, is there one... <coughs> unimpeachable source of reviews for children's books that everyone turns to? Pretty much School Library Journal. School Library Journal? Yes. And how long has that been around? Oh, years. I don't know exactly, right. but a long time. Uh, so there's really five major review journals for children's literature, and you okay. want to get reviewed in all of those. But and, School uh, Library Journal is kind of the big one for schools. Yeah, yeah. and so teachers, everyone who buys teachers these things. Teachers and school librarians go and look at your reviews there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And these days Amazon is important, you know, to have reviews on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't ever remember seeing a children's book with this particular format in it here. The sort, the sort of breaking it down by the months. Although I'm sure someone has has, has done it before. Mm -hmm. Have you had you had you seen it somewhere before? Um, I probably have seen it, but I really like doing it because I know that in kindergarten, first grade, they're going to learn those months. Plus, it just was it just made sense for this one because I was doing the storms. Sure. And each month has a certain storm that could be associated with it. So it just made sense. And, and you've got a, a, a work, some work pages in the back to sort, yes. of, sort of learning guides and, and so forth like that. Is pretty, that pretty much standard practice for a, for a, for a book of this sort? No. Um, Sylvandell really, um, Sylvandell Publishers is the one who published this and they really see that as their sort of signature that they call it for creative minds and they mm -hmm. like putting in their materials that parents, uh, homeschoolers, teachers can just immediately pick up and use with the kids to teach them some concepts. Great, great. So once it's all put together, it's out there, you've publicized it, you, you're on the YouTube channel, you've got your, mm -hmm. got your trailers done and everything like that, and now it's in the hands of kids, and, and, and what are the reactions that you get? Do you get a chance to talk to kids who've picked up the book and read it? I do some, um, um, and I've been getting a lot of great um, reactions. Um, a friend called and said that her grandson had read it and kept on saying, um, I know that animal. 
I've seen that animal. And she'd say, where did you see that animal? He says, well, I took a blue angel over to the prairie to see it. <laughs> He's just right. being really creative yeah. and having, just having a blast. Yeah, um, I also read this to, um, to some uh, students last year um, at the Audubon Society. They had a program. I read it to them, and one boy raised his hand, and he said, you know, that sounded really mellow. Did you mean to do that when you wrote it? <laughs> well, yes, I did. <laughs> so it was a great um, feedback for me as an yeah. author that, that a kid actually noticed that I had worked very hard to make it very easy to read. Easy to read and, and, and a sort of comfort food, for, but learning at the same time. Yeah, I, I, you know, the read aloud qualities are very important to me. Yeah, yeah. Now, when I think of children, when, when I was I was talking to mm -hmm. you before about when I was mm -hmm. a kid, below these many centuries ago, and and children's books, you know, there were picture books for children yes. as well, but we also a lot of what we saw would be illustrated fairy tales. Yes, fairy tales that were based on you know pre-Christian legends, even in some yes. cases, and and not pleasant stories in, in a lot of ways. I mean, stepmothers who wouldn't feed their children, so they have to yes. go out in the woods, or or a, a, a flute player who runs all the kids off a cliff to settle yes. a debt. These were mm -hmm. hard, hard lessons and, and, and gruesome in a lot of cases and, and so forth like that. And, and, you know, you would think, well, that's that's not the best kind of stuff for kids. Although, you know, I did not. It's, it's life. There was, there was a, yeah. It's, it's life. life. It were, they were life lessons. Right. So today you will see, um, I guess what some people would call Disney-fied fairy tales, mm -hmm. where um, if you take the example of the little princess, um, uh, the, the Little Mermaid. Yeah. Uh, the Little Mermaid, actually, in the original story by Hans Christian An Andersen, uh, when she steps out onto land, it's like stepping on knives. Every step she takes is, is painful to her. And in the end, the prince does not marry her. She goes back to the ocean, and she becomes foam on top of the ocean. Yeah. So the Disney version of that <laughs> is very <laughs> different. Light and fun, lots of songs. Um, so you see that, but children's literature, I think, balances, if you look at the, the range of books published today, I think there's a balance. There's still some of those light, happy stories, but there are some stories that have elements of real life, tragedy, um, things happen. And what matters to me is the ending. Is there a note of hope? Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not the terrible tragedy. But do, that's what literature does. Sure, yeah. Now, do the publishers do they set down sort of sanctions that say, hey, you, you can't go this place, you can't be this dark or gruesome or something like that? Or is it, it's sort of basically understood. The authors know their market and, and, they, and they write Well, the old joke it. was that um, children's books are just like adult books, except 100 pages shorter and no sex scene. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> st stick with that and you're, you can't go too far wrong, right? Well, young adult books these days do that sex scene sometimes. Oh, but, is that right? Uh, yeah. So it's a, but it's they're a changing very world. edgy. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a crowded category. I mean, everyone, yes. it seems like everyone, uh, far more people aspire to write a children's book, I'm thinking, than people would, would write a novel for adults. And I, I don't know why that is, frankly. I mean, if you I don't know about why, that, but it, you know why? I don't know why. You don't know why? Because it's very difficult. A children's book is 500 words or less, usually 500 or less. And in that amount of space, you must introduce a character, introduce a problem, complicate the problem, and then have some wrap up uh, where they solve the problem in 500 words. And that's, that 500 words is about the average middle sized letter you would write to someone, right? Yes, I mean, it's that's two type double spaced pages. Yeah, yeah. Yes, 500 words is all you get. So editing is, is crucial, crucial. In, in your business. Yeah. Yes, when I um, talk to a beginning writer about their picture books, um, basically I tell them cut it in half. Hmm. So if they start out at 1,000 words, I say cut it in half to 500 words to and start, then yeah. see if you can cut out another 100. Yeah, wow, and that's not easy. That's the hardest part of writing, isn't it? Is yes. it editing? Yeah. Yes, it's very difficult to write a children's picture book. Yeah. yeah. Now novels for kids, again, uh, you know, as long as you have a kid as a main character and it's a kid appropriate problem that's going on in the story, it's not much different than an adult story. Mm -hmm. Where do people who, who, who decide they've, they've got a kid's story to tell and, and, and write a book, where do they go wrong? What, what's, what's the generally the most wrong-headed notion people can have when they enter into a, an enterprise like that? Well, the first thing that, that people do for picture books is they write a rhymed picture book oh. that uh, tells uh, a moral. 
that's has over, a moral right? to that's it. That's done, right? No, <laughs> those are not going to sell. <laughs> no, that's, that's been done. And, yes. And, okay. um, you can do rhyme stories. Of course, we do Cat in the Hat, and, and that's why it's so popular. Sure. Yeah. But it must be immaculate. There yeah. must be no problems with the poetry. It must be uh, just absolutely beautiful. Okay. And uh, when, you, when you say, you know, a picture book should uh, teach a lesson, that's probably not going to go over with most publishers. Mostly what they want is a good story. Yeah. And yeah. The, the lesson that you want to teach must be integral to the story. And a lot of people pursue that because they think they have a lesson that needs to be taught or something. Yes. And, and, it's and the wrong motive. That's the wrong, that's the wrong direction to, to, yes. to take it in. Darcy, I know we should spend a little time talking about all the awards and the, the citations <laughs> and, and honors that you've received for, for your prolific uh, writing career, but we don't have time for all that because it's too much of it. But let's talk about one thing that's very recent and kind of timely now, the novel The Help, of course, was a huge, gigantic blockbuster and uh, followed up by a very successful movie. And they had a contest, a sort of a writing-based contest uh, connected to that movie. Tell us about that and how you got involved in that. Well, thehelpmovie.com had a writing contest for recipes, inspirational stories, or children's stories. Of course, I entered the children's story. Um, it had a word limit of 400 words. We talked about uh, under 500. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a story that was 600 words long. I added a nanny, cut 200 words, and entered, <laughs> and I won. Oh my gosh. Um, very a lot of exciting. entries, I would imagine, too. So I have no idea how many entries. No. Um, the head writer for uh, Sesame Street, uh, Lou Berger, was the, the judge. Wow. Um, and very exciting. What I win is illustrations. So again, the author doesn't do the illustrations. <laughs> they will have it illustrated, and it'll be a free download on thehelpmovie.com. Um, by mid-October. Wow, you win and you get a book and uh, there it is. Right. What a, what a great And deal. it will be a book available on Amazon too. So we'll just look for that online. Just, yes. Just Google the help and, and book and that'll probably yes. be there, right? Yes, yeah. or the Amazon, yeah. Or, and Amazon, good. So the story is actually called um, 11 Ways to Ruin a Fro Photograph. Um, because I live near the Little Rock Air Force Base, um, I see families where the father is sent off um, overseas and um, I always look at it from the kid's point of view. It's very sad. Yeah. So one little girl says, my daddy's not here. It is not a family photo album, and no picture of me will turn out good. So she finds ways to ruin the photograph every month, month by month again. Oh, that's a great um, So she has an umbrella. The wind blows her, the hair across her face things like that, so a lot of fun. Not that kids need any help on ruining photographs. That was like <laughs> no. a hobby of mine when I was <laughs> of course. Yeah, but, but what a great idea, and congratulations. Thanks. I want to look at a, just a couple. You have a, you have a wonderful catalog uh, of children's books. This, these two are really fantastic. We look at the Oliver, uh, the journey of Oliver K. Woodman, and searching for Oliver K. Woodman. Different from Prairie Storms yes. because these are the, the, these although are there's learning in this. These but are it's fiction. fiction. Yes, it's fiction, but it takes place in real places on the map. Yes, in the United States, and Oliver K. Woodman is a man who's made of wood and 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 gets around. Yes, yeah. uh, those stories are about Tamika who wants to see her uncle, Uncle Ray. And she lives in California, he lives in South Carolina. She wrote, writes him a letter and says, please come see me. And he says, I have to work, can't come. But my friend will come, so he builds a wooden man, puts him out on the road, and the story is about the wooden man's travels. And when I wrote that, um, I actually got out a map of the United States and started looking at all the places where he might go. And basically it's places where I either wanted to go, I had friends or family, or places I've never seen, never been to. I tell kids, they wind up um, at the Redwood Forest, and I tell kids, if you go to Little Rock and you look at those skyscrapers that are 200 feet tall, that is what the Redwoods are like, wow, yeah. a forest of that, and I want to see it. Yeah. I've never seen it. I still haven't seen it. <laughs> I don't have the time and money to go to California that's, to see that's that. It's a long way out there. But you know, the nice thing as an author is that um, my characters can go. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did, is I sent, sent my character across the, the United States. It's actually used um, in, in classrooms. Teachers tell me it's great for teaching letter writing, for teaching uh, social studies, geography, map reading, lots of things. But for me, again, it was the story that was important. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's what strikes you. Look at that, you know, this is not a, a thing for the classroom, but like, as you say, it, it, it turns out that way. You have other novels in, in this category and other categories. Do you have any in the older children's categories that you've produced? I do have yeah. one novel that, that is out. It's called The Wayfinder. 
and it's a middle grade novel. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it's uh, it's unique. I, I know we don't have too much time to get into it, but it's uh, what it, in in a sentence, what is it about? Um, it's a fantasy story about a, a boy um, who goes um, on a quest for healing for his land. Oh, okay. Well, good. Well, we, we look for that. You you write for children's highlights. I mean, something that all <laughs> all ages of our audience can has, has been looking at for years and years and years, and 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 lots of other publications as well. You write about quilting. You write about writing. So so you're a busy person, but but before we let you go out of here, let, let's read some Prairie Storms. Okay. And, and we're going to, can, can we go three months? Can we, can we say take the fall of the year sure. and take us through that? That would be wonderful. We can do that. September. The burrowing owl chicks have grown and flown, but the mama and papa owls still linger near their underground nest. A sudden cloudburst drums the land, spreading an early autumn chill. But when a rainbow arches the sky, it's time. The burrowing owls take wing and fly toward warmer lands. October. One night thunder echoes and autumn winds wail. Suddenly hailstones pound the ground. Caught in the open, the cougar dashes to his den. Hidden beneath a wide ledge, he watches and gnaws on dry and brittle bones. November. Icy needles of sleet coat the dried grasses and weigh down the trees. The bald eagle clenches its branches, enduring, letting its wings shed the sleet. When the storm passes, the eagle preens, then soars to hunt. Starcy Patterson's A Prairie Storms, a children's book that is it's your latest effort and, and very, very nice and takes us through the seasons of the year, month by month. And it's a great way to, to, to enjoy the prairie and the wildlife that, and the habitat that's there and so forth. What are you working on now, Darcy? Uh, well, the companion book for this will be out next August, and it is called Desert Baths. So it is how animals in the desert take a bath. So it's, again, a habitat, animals, and that extra thing, this time hygiene. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you found a good thing. You're going to stay with it. And it is a good thing. Prairie Storms is definitely something you want to check out if you have a youngster around the house. It's it's great reading. It's fun. It's a good story, and it's and and you learn a lot. And all the other books in your, in your catalog as well. For all of that, congratulations. Thank and, you. And and carry on. Thanks. This is good stuff. Thank you, Darcy Patterson, our guest today on on the same page.